The Soviet Navy is one of the most interesting naval forces in the world, and it really always has been. There is a clear evolution between Tsarist Navy to Red Navy to modern Russian Navy, and throughout history you have a case of either pure competence at sea and brilliance, such as Rossuspensky and the crew of the ship we're going to be talking about today, or you have this. The light, well technically heavy cruiser, but we'll get to that, Krasny Kavkaz, is a great example of this kind of incompetent insanity born from desperation to appear big on the world stage, and while not entirely a story like that of the 2nd Pacific Squadron, K-19, or I know the other ones we looked at, it is rather quite interesting in how the Soviet Union threw a bunch of pig iron onto a floating hull and tried to pass it off as brilliance. What is even more surprising is somehow the crew managed to channel voodoo from a Sputin to make it work. But how do you get to this point? Well, let's find out. But first, a word from today's sponsor. Call of War is a free online PvP strategy game, and in it, you can choose a real country to lead from World War II. Forge alliances and make enemies with up to 100 players in real time games that will last weeks on end. Using tanks, planes, or even the bomb, choose your own strategy and take over the free world. For me, Call of War is the perfect game to play when you just need that immersion and kick from history. Or if you're, well, stuck in an airport like I have been for the last few years, non-stop because of work. It really is the perfect game if you're ever stuck. You can play on both your PC and your mobile, but more importantly, note that there is an exclusive gift of 13,000 gold and one month premium subscription for free by clicking the link in my description below. I'll also include it in the pinned comment. This is available for only 30 days only, so be sure to be quick. And thank you again for Call of War for sponsoring this video. Now, once the Soviet Union was established, the innocent people were terrorised for owning a particularly nice sock and the white Russians were massacred, the state of the Red military was somewhere between crap and inept, and quite a lot of work was needed to make it able to stand for longer than five minutes against the great enemies of the Soviet Empire, I mean, Union of Equals. It's not an empire. It was an empire. For those who say it wasn't an empire, it absolutely was. The Navy in particular, coming off the back of being treated worse than a weeaboo's anime body pillow in 1905 against Japan, and then having some marginal success but really just a fair bit of sadness and nothing in World War I, was in an even worse state. To the Russian Empire's credit, it had managed to get its proverbial shit together following the Russo-Japanese War, and had churned out a pretty decent fleet. Nothing particularly amazing, mind you, but the new dreadnoughts of which, although they look a bit how do you do, were actually quite good, all things considered, and above all, the Tsar's navy had managed to churn out some pretty damn good cruisers and destroyers. The Ottomans were easily now matched in the Black Sea by these new ships, and the Germans were in the position that on the one side they had the British looking menacingly, and on the other side they had a particularly decent sized navy that could quite easily work towards the kind of warfare known as the Junacol, or the Small War at Sea. Now you may ask, Junacol, that sounds French, not Russian. Well, yes it is. It's the kind of warfare it's seen invented by the French who had spent the best part of 100 years from 1700 to 1800 being in a particularly violent relationship with the Royal Navy. The idea was, and this is a bit of a simplification, that a lot of cheap boats could hold off and defeat the enemy with a smaller number of big boats. So, sort of swarm tactics. There is an extent that it does work. See what Ukraine's doing in the Black Sea at the moment with drones. You can use smaller ships to defeat bigger ships. Lots of smaller ships, fewer bigger ships. It works out. And the Italians did this with great effect during the First World War, using mass boats to sink an Austro-Hungarian dreadnought. But let's be honest, you don't willingly engage in this kind of warfare if you can afford ships, and if you have ships. The simple fact was, France at the time couldn't afford ships anywhere near on the scale the British could, and Russia, in 1914, after the aforementioned anime body pillow treatment by the IJN, could not exactly afford a battle fleet to go head-to-head -head with Kaiser Willy's pet navy. So what does this have to do with the Soviet cruiser from 1932? Yeah, I'm getting there, hang on. The Soviet Navy, technically founded in 1918, but only given actual time to breathe and organize itself following the Civil War in the early 1920s, was in a state somewhere akin to a university student's liver during orientation week. It had lost most of its surface warships during the war to either joining the White Corps, getting sunk, or in general just falling apart, because let's be honest, with the state of the Russian Empire in 1917, and later the Soviet Union, Maintenance wasn't exactly a known word, and, well, understandably so. This doesn't excuse them for forgetting what maintenance is after the war and into the 1990s and present day, but for this period, we'll give them a bit of a pass. The Soviets, rightly having the brain power to understand that they can't dick measure against the Western naval powers, 
probably time to point out that Lenin was in charge, not Stalin, yet, decided to go around and look at the different partially completed hulls sitting on the slipways around the Soviet Union. Some particularly enterprising fellows made their way into the Ukrainian SSR to the Mikolaev shipyards and noticed that there was a 60% completed hull floating around the harbour called Admiral Lazarev. Initially, it was laid down in 1913 and launched three years later. The ship was intended to be completed as one of the new light cruisers that I mentioned at the start of the video for the renewed Imperial Russian Navy after Tsushima. Given that the Soviet industry wasn't the best, this practically new, albeit quite rusty hulk bobbing around the harbour covered in enough weeds to double as a set for Jurassic Park, was a godsend and would allow the Soviets to start reconstituting the Black Sea Fleet, which was in a really bad state like, following all the war, and if it came to it, it would have genuinely been in a lot of trouble had the Turks and Soviets ended up at each other's throats, which, let's be honest, there's a bit of historical precedence there. And it's quite sad when you realise it, because the Soviets, well, the Russians before the Soviets, had a fleet that could easily wipe the Turkish fleet out, or well, the Ottoman fleet, later Turkish fleet. Then the Civil War happened, and then, well, the Soviets inherited pretty much nothing. As an interesting anecdote, the cruiser, if you can call it that, given its state of completion at the time, had already been owned by the Russian Empire, then it was captured by the German Empire, then it was handed over to the Triple Entente, and then the White Russians, and then finally, the Soviets got it. But anyway, moving on. It is now 1927, Lenin has died, Stalin is now the god emperor of the Soviet Union, and the Admiral Lazarev and his sister ship Admiral Nakamov, also bobbing in the harbour, have been selected for completion. The slight issue with, though, is the size of the ships. Although they are both cruisers, the difference between a cruiser from 1913 and 1927 are quite remarkable. For comparison's sake, a light cruiser built at the same time in the United Kingdom, the HMS, later HMNZS, Leander, was 169.1 metres, or 554 feet long. It was armed with eight 6-inch turreted guns, and it was around 9,700 tonnes at full load, and it could cruise at 32.5 knots, and it had a tremendous cruising range. Our hero, meanwhile, as designed, was 163.2 metres, or 535 feet long, but only 7,600 tons, and armed with 15 single mount 5.1 inch guns with a speed of around 29 knots. While the difference between 5.1 and 6 inches doesn't sound like much, it is, I'm sorry to say, in gun calibre, get your mind out of the gutter. Not to mention the advantage of turreted guns under direct fire control rather than the single guns. And although the size doesn't sound tremendously different in length, I mean, 163 meters versus 169 meters, that weight is huge. Had Leander come into contact with a ship like this during the Second World War, or just after its completion, both their completions, Leander would have absolutely crippled her old relative from before the First World War. This isn't me trying to insult the ship, it's just pointing out the limitations at the time. An extra five meters along with an increase in tonnage and just advances in design really do make a difference. The Soviets were well aware of the limitations of these older ships' hulls as well, and after completing the first hull of Shavonok Ukraina to the original design, it was decided in an attempt to modernize, something radical would be done with the second hull, now known as Krasny Kavkaz, the Red Caucasus. Tangent here, for those who don't know, the difference between a light and a heavy cruiser is purely down to gun caliber, and it is really outlined in the naval treaties following the First World War. Prior to the war, you have all manner of cruisers, scout cruisers with tiny quick-firing guns, light cruisers with around 5-6 to six inch guns, and then armoured cruisers, usually with four big guns and some smaller ones, and of course, the king of the cruiser, the battle cruiser, with all big guns. It is all a bit complicated, but they all had perceived roles. Jutland and Dogger Bank really showed just how out of place the armoured cruiser was in the modern world, and it would die off very quickly following the war, with the only remaining armoured cruiser in the world being the Greek museum ship Georgia Savarov. Scout cruisers were also becoming so outmatched by even destroyers that they were now deemed to be, well, essentially pointless. The light cruiser survived as a good middle ground, but what if you needed something slightly bigger, especially now that battleships were being limited? Six-inch guns were great, but they just didn't cover all the bases. Again, get your mind out of the gutter, not like that. Sometimes a navy just needs a bit more, and so the heavy cruiser was born. For the sake of simplicity, like I said, the only real difference between a heavy and a light cruiser is the gun calibre. Armour does not come into this at all. Take a look at the French heavy cruisers from the interwar period. Those things had basically paper for armour. And the new, well, newish Soviet cruiser Shavona Ukraina with 5.1 inch guns was very weak, when it comes to being a light cruiser that is, compared to our contemporaries in 1927, let alone the ships that were being planned. 
The Soviets therefore had this idea that they could fit twin 8-inch guns to the hull that was fitting out, eight of them in fact, which off the bat was just an insane idea because they for one just wouldn't fit and two, if you did put these guns on it, it is questionable whether the hull could handle the weight, let alone the recoil. So back to the drawing board and the Soviets were really quite intent on putting a big gun on the hull. With orders from high up to make a strong cruiser, the design team really had no choice. It was either make a big strong heavy cruiser or, you know, Stalin. Granted, he wasn't purging everyone yet with the liberal application of brass to the upper skull. He was just implementing policies to starve everyone north of Mikolaev shipyard to death. Either way, it is the Soviet Union. You do as you're told. Somebody took a look around though and noticed that the Soviet Union had this big gun that just might fit in the form of the BL 7.1 inch Mark VI naval gun. A 7.1 inch gun would satisfy the need for the ship to be upgunned and far more capable than Shivana Ukraina with her 5.1 inch guns. Slight issue though, the ship could only fit four instead of the 15 smaller guns, again due to size limitations, and the weight was now pushed up to 9,000 tons on a full load, almost equaling the much larger Leander class cruisers I had mentioned before. So you have a smaller hull that you're just stuffing more things into. This can only go well. Krasny Kavkaz would therefore be finished as the powerfully armed 7.1 inch armed cruiser, which by definition could be considered a heavy cruiser-ish on the world stage. Her superstructure and funnels were redesigned to form a sleek and powerful looking vessel that signaled the return of the Great Russian Fleet to the world stage. At least that's what the propaganda said, and the outside said. The reality was not entirely the same. The Krasny Kavkaz, well yes it was armed with 7.1 inch guns, it only had four in single turret mounts, and this was in 1932. For comparison's sake, the Imperial Japanese Navy commissioned the cruiser Takao in 1932 armed with 10 8-inch guns. The United States at the round time was introducing the Northampton class with 9 8-inch guns. The British, Italian and French fleets were also commissioning ships with at least 8 8-inch guns. Which doesn't bode well for any kind of plausible engagement the ship might find itself in with a foreign power, save for maybe Turkey, which, let's be honest, precedents aside, wasn't exactly going to get involved in a conflict during the interwar period, it had its own internal issues. In an attempt to flaunt the power of the Krasny Kavkaz, a big emphasis has been made upon how fast the shell velocity was from her guns, giving her the incredible range of 38.5 kilometers or 23.9 miles. Now this is a really, really impressive range, especially when you compare it to the equivalent British 7.5 inch guns in the Hawking class cruiser. It is less impressive when you consider the ability to hit anything at this range is the equivalent of a near Confederate succeeding in their attempt to speak to a woman. That isn't a direct relation. Well, yes, it is true these guns technically outranged everything else comparable in size. Soviet fire control at the time was not exactly the best or remotely on par with Western systems, and further to that, the guns weren't exactly the most stable, nor were the mounts the best. Although they aren't as bad as the mounts on the Kirov class cruisers, but that's another thing entirely, and I'll get to that at a later date. Further to that, the gun itself could only fire a few dozen rounds before the barrel needed to be replaced. Yeah, that's right a few dozen rounds, which is just astronomically bad. Turns out stuffing the gun with cordite to make the shell go far doesn't actually make your gun better. For comparison's sake, that British 7.5 inch gun I mentioned, yeah, its average life expectancy for a barrel was 650 full charges, which you know is quite a bit more. Not to mention the speed was relatively slow. Now, 29 knots isn't bad by any means, but it really isn't great when you compare it to the low to mid 30s that other cruisers at the time were pulling off. Therefore, in their attempt to make a powerfully armed cruiser, in reality, the Soviets produced the nicest looking turd to ever sail in the Soviet Navy, entering service on the 25th of January, 1932. Initially, the ship would take part in cruises around the Black Sea, Greece, Turkey, and Italy, showing the flag and such, and in this role, she was seemingly quite effective. At the time, it is worth mentioning the USSR and fascist Italy were quite close, particularly when it came to naval development, and many of the ships the USSR would field during and after World War II had their roots in Italy, such as the Kiros that I mentioned before, destroyers too, like the Tashkent. Krasny Kavkaz would have a relatively quiet career largely due to geography and her base in the Black Sea meaning that she took no part in the early stages of World War II, in which the Soviet Union allied with Nazi Germany, invaded Poland, and later alone invaded Finland. However, come June 22, 1941, 
the ship would be engaged on almost the very first day of Operation Barbarossa during the bombarding of Sevastopol by the Luftwaffe. The naval war in the Black Sea honestly warrants its own video, but the situation was thus that the Soviets held a numerical advantage in firepower over the Axis powers, able to call on the battleship Parishkaya Komuna, Paris Commune, two modern cruisers, four older ones that had varying levels of rebuild, including Krasny Kavkaz and Shabana Ukraina, 14 modern destroyers, and then a smattering of older ships. The Axis, meanwhile, had four destroyers of varying use and some smaller ships. The big equaliser, though, was that during the initial stages of the war, the Axis had total dominance over the skies. With the rapid Axis advance into the Ukraine and USSR, the Soviet Black Sea Fleet would therefore find itself playing the role of convoy escort, resupply, and gunfire support. There would be no major fleet engagements, and this was helped by both the Montreux Convection, but also the fact that the Italian Navy was busy bit now being slapped around by Cunningham and HMS Warspite with her never-ending plot armour. On the 11th of September 1941, the Krasny Kavkaz fired her guns in anger for the first time on German forces approaching Odessa, and she would further have the task of ferrying naval infantry into Odessa and the surrounding regions to assist with the defence of the city, making multiple runs between Sevastopol and Odessa and acting as a floating fire support battery. A standout moment of the ship's wartime service was her participation in the Kerch Feodosia landing operation on the 28th of December 1941. After taking aboard around 1900 paratroopers supporting light artillery and vehicles, the ship forced a landing whilst under fire in Feodosia Bay. The cruiser would take 13 hits from German coastal batteries leaving gaping holes in the vessel that were plugged with whatever could be found. According to Soviet records, a German shell penetrated the armour of the cruiser and exploded in the second turret amongst the ammunition. And whilst the flames engulfed the powder bags and very nearly spread to the ammunition store, which would have certainly destroyed the ship, a sailor named Vasily Pukutkin regained his composure following a hit, and unable to in any way to throw the flaming bags overboard or flood where he was standing, he threw his body onto the flames to snuff them out, and suffered horrific burns to his body because of this. The next day, the ship was attacked 25 times by aircraft, on the 4th of January, the ship would again return landing more troops but would come under attack by Stukas, being hit with her stern thrown out of the water and her right propeller thrown off, and the left propeller shaft becoming gravely damaged. The ship would take on 2,000 tonnes of water and settle deeply into the ocean, keeping in mind she was already massively overweight, and by some miracle the ship made it back to port on the 3rd of April 1942, and due to this action she would be awarded the Guards title. As the Soviet lines advanced, the role of the Black Sea Fleet became less and less important, and the Krasny Kavkaz would find herself relegated to far less risky operations. By this time, the ship had engaged in at least 30 combat operations, including 9 fire support missions, 2 mine clearance operations, and the continuous transport of soldiers. She had travelled 14,000 miles and transported around 25,000 soldiers, and assisted in evacuation. Surviving the war, the Krasny Kavkaz would be relegated to the role of a training ship before being ex retired and expended in a test of the first Soviet anti-ship missile, the SSN-1, in 1956. The Krasny Kavkaz represents in many ways the very best and the very worst of the Soviet Navy. On the one hand, you can truly see what can and did happen with Soviet vessels when they had competent commanders and crews. The ship undoubtedly paid for herself and punched so far above her weight it's not even funny during the war years. And yes, this has helped a fair bit by the fact she didn't have to engage in surface warfare with any contemporaries, of which she 100% would have lost. On the other hand, the Krasny Kavkaz is a clear example of a solid idea, that being the rebuilding and expanding of the Russian, now Soviet fleet by making use of whatever you have available, and then ruining it by attempting to make make a thing bigger. In many ways, it is not too dissimilar to the modern Kirov class cruisers, sometimes called a battle cruiser by the wrong people in a rush to make the biggest and greatest thing, the Soviets put to sea a colossal behemoth that has to partially sink itself to fire its main weaponry because it was designed to be used in a submarine. Smakalka does not mean good. At the end of the day, the Krasny Kavkaz is lucky, very lucky, that it never had to face another surface ship in combat. But it also has a pretty damn brilliant track record. And although the hull was small, the engines were old and they were pretty slow, the guns were horrific, the accommodation for the crew as of all Soviet ships was quite dated and not great. And, you know, it's not exactly great being on a ship being run by a commissar. I kind of have a soft spot for this one. Thank you again to my patrons and members. You guys are amazing. Don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, and join the Discord. And a huge thank you to Call of War for sponsoring this video. Remember to click the link in the description to choose your own strategy and engage in epic battles to fight your way to victory with your chosen country. Just remember that the 13,000 gold and one month premium subscription gift 
is only available for 30 days. So make sure you don't miss out.